Ladies and gentlemen, angry Americans around the country and around the world, happy new year, happy new war. Uh, I come to you live with a fantastic, inspiring, exceptionally timely guest. The great and powerful Mazdaq Rossi is here. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Classic Car Club. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Welcome to 2020. I know. I'm psyched about it. Are you? Yeah. Tell us why. I'm super optimistic. Tell us why. Um, Well, I read this other thing. I read the other day, you know, about you look at the last millennia, I mean, the last hundred years, sorry. And you look at it and you go, okay, we just entered the 20s. So what was it 100 years ago? It was the 1920s. It was the roaring 20s. It was an incredible time for achievement and progress and architecture. And um, it was a really monumental time. And I think, I'm thinking the same. I'm kind of, I'm attaching it to the 20s. I'm, I'm kind of excited. That's a good way to start. Because <laughs> I don't think most people are feeling excited right now. The first know, couple of weeks of the I year, know. you know, wars are potentially being escalated. Planes are falling from the sky. I people know. are under stress. But I'm, I'm so happy to sit with you for a number of different reasons, in part because I think you were the first guest on this show that has ever had the formal endorsement of Kanye to the <laughs> point where Kanye has called you a visionary. You got some interesting friends, man, that I'm excited to get into, but he called you a visionary, and I, and I really think that you are, and we're going to need visionaries in times like this. We've known each other a long time. Before we get into that, tell everybody what we're drinking today, because I ask everybody, what do you want to drink? What's your drink of choice? And you, you chose two things, uh, is the message we got, and I figured, <laughs> shit, after this week, we might need both, so what are we drinking? Well, what happened was, um, I think that... I kind of everybody knows my drink is the 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 1942 Don Julio cuz when I was growing up you know in, in the Midwest we were so broke we just when we were like in college you know used to drink the worst tequila in the world and you would you'd have these like adverse effects the next day and you'd you know you have to pump your stomach and so I, so later in life when you finally can you know afford a nice drink you you learn about like the good stuff, which is like 1942 Don Julio. So the minute I had my first sip, which was probably like about eight years ago, I was like, this is it. I can truly say I'm a tequila lover. And so, you know, we're lucky enough to drink this incredible drink. We got, I think you got my wife hooked on that too. Yeah. My, wife, my wife's always been a tequila fan, but I think after she started working <laughs> with you, she came back asking for the good stuff. Yeah. And I get a lot of people hooked on Don Julio, nineteen. You get a lot of people hooked on a lot of things. You get a lot of people hooked on music, on makeup, on art. Uh, and we also have kind of a more traditional choice, Johnny Walker Black, right? That was in case we don't have the Julio 42, which we do have. You also said Johnny Walker back Black. So again, I think after the last couple of days, we might need both. Yeah, I know. It, it, it's Drinking is good. What do, you, what do you think about Johnny Walker Black? I think that's always been my go-to back in the day. And so when, when you guys first asked, what's funny is, is that I replied and I I was try I didn't want to be rude and ask for 1942 Don Julio. And so I asked for Johnny Walker Black. And then my assistant was like, no, he only drinks 19. So I went to her and I said, I hope you didn't tell them. <laughs> I was like, you know, that's an expensive bottle. So when I showed up, I saw boats. I felt even no, double no, 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 worse. No, 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 no. Do not feel it. It's a time for, 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 for good reflection and good drinks. And it's interesting too, because I was talking to somebody, we talk about whiskey on the show. We talk about a lot of things on the show, but before single malts became so available around the world, I feel like Johnny Walker Black used to be like the stuff, right? If you wanted yeah. to give somebody a really good gift, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, before all the single malts were all over the world, and especially internationally, like when I was in the Middle yeah. East, a bottle of Johnny Walker Black yeah. was, 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 was unique, right? It was yeah. kind of the shit at the time. Now we have all these multitude of options, but that used to be one of our limited best options. Yeah, and it, it's kind of like you start having the regular Johnny Walker, and then at some point you... You migrate, you kind of move up to the black. And then when you can really do it, you go to the blue and then you realize you don't need to be in the blue. The black is just as good. I think that's true. Because the blue is a bit too creamy. Hmm. It's a bit too creamy. So you, you kind of come back down and then you find your spot. 
like black is good. You don't need to move up. See, this is this is why I'm so excited. That you are a connoisseur of many things. Now, for folks, folks won't know this, but we met, I don't know, man, may, over a decade ago. Yeah. Right? So you, my, my wife, um, worked closely with you and your team when you guys were launching and building and growing this amazing brand and movement of milk that's become so many things. But I kind of first met you because you guys were doing these sick fashion events. You guys were launching like the coolest fashion events on the planet. And I was basically like extra security. I'd come from talking about the Iraq war and my wife would be doing a fashion event. And it was like the ultimate escape for me. And I had never been exposed to the world of fashion. And it was fucking awesome. It was some of the best creative energy and music and, uh, and art that I had ever seen. And I think for the haters from the outside, they're like, oh, you know, fashion shows are this, you guys turned it upside down. So yeah, know, seeing that, witnessing that was how I became friends with yeah. you and your amazing wife, Zana, and your whole crew. But it's been incredibly inspiring to see your growth and the dynamism and all the projects you're, you're into. But I want to start, part of why I want to talk to you is because of where you come from, where you yeah. came yeah. from. And the news that's so relevant right now, I can't think of, the, of anyone that's better to talk to in some ways because you, you were born in Iran yep. and now you're here. And you're this incredible American success story. Thank you are you are living yeah. the American dream, man. And, and I think with all the news happening in the world, I wanted to bring it down to a personal level. Yeah. I wanted to talk about people and I wanted people to hear from a person yeah. who could kind of shape up these times and all that's going on in the world. And, and that's you, man. So for folks who don't know your story, yeah. can you take us back mm. to how did the Rossi story start? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's exactly what you, it is an American story, you know, and. And I think that, uh, you know, I was born in Iran in 1970, and my brother is a year older than me. And, um, you know, we were born into a really great family. My my father uh, came to America when he was younger and, and went to Cornell. He went to the University of Texas. And um, he kept going back to Iran and moving up and helping build. He was in education. And so he worked his way all the way up. Uh, into being a chancellor at a university. He built a few universities through Iran. Um, and so we moved around uh, the country in different cities while he was building these universities and really bringing Western education in. And he was working for the king at the time. There was the Shah of Iran. And, um, you know, it was a very prosperous time in Iran. And um, when you went around the world, even as a kid, and you said, oh, I'm from, you know, we're from Iran, People, it was very prestigious. It was really incredible. And I remember as a kid. And, um, you know, we grew up also in England and we were in Switzerland a lot. So we traveled a lot. And uh, my father always wanted me and my brother to have Western education as well as uh, learning about where we come from. But it was really about thinking about the world. And um, he worked his way all the way up in the education division, almost up to uh, becoming a minister of education. And, um, you know, in 1979, 78, there was turmoil. And, you know, 79, it all ended. I mean, there was a revolution. And the Islamic revolution happened. And uh, we, me, my mom, and my brother were actually in England. We were in London at, at, at a place that we, our second home. And my dad was in Iran. And and I, I'll always remember the night he called and he said, you know, it's getting really bad here. And uh, and then the next day he was in, in England, like he just showed up. And, and I'll never forget the day, like I was I was about nine years old and my brother was 10. And, and he just looked at my mom and he said, it's over. Like, we can't go back. And and my mom's like, what do you mean it's over? Like my, all our relatives are there, our homes, our family. And we were like, just no, it's not safe. And it was like the French Revolution. I mean, they burned everything to the ground. It was a major, major change. And so my mom was like, that's not right. So she grabbed me and my brother and uh, all the phone lines were cut. And my dad basically said, don't go. But she was like, what do you mean? Not? I mean, imagine like someone tells you tonight, you're never going home. Right. You know, and she said, I don't know what you're talking about. So she grabbed us. She went back to Iran. And our last name, Rossi, which is actually my last name, you know, people knew of my dad. He was pretty high up in the government. And 
working uh, in education. And, and so we, me and my brother and my mom landed in Tehran right after the revolution. Like she's just like thinking she's coming home. There's something temporarily. And the minute we landed, we realized, oh my God, my mom realized like this place has completely changed. It, it was a major revolution. They burned so many things down. We went to our home. Somebody was already living in it. So we acted like we went to the wrong address, turned around and went and stayed with my uncles. And then we spent the next sort of year trying to figure out how to get out. And, um, you know, my father at the time left England and came to America. He was very good friends with uh, a few chancellors and university presidents that were, that he had met over the years. And, um, and he came to Champaign, Illinois, University of Illinois, Champaign, Urbana. And he kind of came there with, you know, and we had no money, like everything was gone. And um, he made his way to America with, through political asylum. And we're stuck in Iran. And um, this is at the height of the craziness. Like, so we're kind of camped out of my uncle's house. And my mom decides that she's going to just, we had some storage with some rugs. She sold everything on the black market, sold all her jewelry. And um, we went straight to the U.S. Embassy to try to get out. And my father had helped and got us uh, political asylum papers to the U.S. Embassy in Iran. And basically, through cryptic messages on the phone, was like, go to the U.S. Embassy. So we go there and the line is like six months long. So we waited in line, me, my mom, my brother. We didn't go to school. Um, we waited in line and, uh, you know, we would move up 10 feet at a time every day. And, and after many, many, many months, um, I remember the day we got to the gates and it was just covered in black fabric because they the, the U.S. Embassy put black fabric up because it was like this. I remember looking through it and inside seeing the Marines. And it was like this heaven, this little block in the middle of craziness that was like our freedom, hopefully. You know, we didn't know. So we work our way in. And I remember coming into the vestibule. And uh, it was like Argo, the movie, literally. Mm, yeah. yeah. And, um we finally go in and they, this young lady had to literally in the embassy go find our papers. And she basically grabbed my mom. She said, you need to go straight to the airport. If anybody opens this envelope and the seal is broken, you won't get into the United States. And we went home, we packed, we went straight to the airport. And the airport in Tehran was exactly like Argo. It was mayhem. And somehow through all the craziness, kind of used it to our advantage to move in. And, you know, five, six hours later, we're sitting in Air France and the plane is just like silent. And, you know, the, these, these new, you know, revolutionary people are coming on board, pulling people out. And it's like, it was nuts. And then we finally started getting taxing, finally started getting on the runway. And all of the, I remember looking at the Air France um, flight attendants, they had veils, on, they had like that to wear chadors and, you know, just they were so everyone was like, why are we still flying to this place? You know, right, it's right, like, right. and the plane started taking off. And about, you know, as soon as it was about 15 feet off the ground, the plane erupted. Everyone was crying. Women were ripping their veils. And and then we landed at Charles de Gaulle. They took the whole airplane because it was all Iranians. Literally, we were in, in, a, in another area. And then we got on a flight, came to, uh, landed at O'Hare you know, hours, tens of hours later. And then they took the entire Iranian group, put them in a room. And then we walked into a room. Um, and then my dad came in on the other side. And then we got, we got our new, you know, lease on life. They were like, you know, welcome to America. They were like, you know, and my mom's like, so where, where are we going? He's like, it's this little town called Champagne. It's really <laughs> lovely. And we started with nothing. And my mom, you know, she borrowed uh, $3,000 from my cousin, her cousin in Montreal, who'd already got out. And um, we started a whole new life. I was nine. My brother was 10. And... You know, and it was scary. It was like this new place. We had nothing. We moved into this little 
one bedroom apartment that you know the university gave my dad and hired him but it was like the most incredible thing because we felt safe mm. like my parents were safe and it was like america that grew up in iran like looking at like the 6 million dollar man steve austin like america was everything to any kid growing up in america like first on the moon you know jfk so you you were like you know within a month we were on basketball team the baseball team the football team <laughs> You know, and we're American. And, you know, and, it, and that is what is so incredible about this country. This is what we can never lose. And why, you know, I feel like it's important for me to tell that story. You know, today there are half a million Iranian Americans. But what's funny is growing up, I never called, we, ne we don't call ourselves Iranian Americans. We're American. I never called mm -hmm. myself, it's not like Italian Americans, right. Right. you know, It is, we're Americans, you know? You, every once in a while, you'll throw the thing Persian, you know, uh -huh. it throws everybody off. We can get into that. Uh -huh. you know? But that's, that's what it is. This country assimilates refugees and immigrants. And for me, it's never been about how many should we, I never wanted to get into the, the, the argument of how many we should let in, even though this country is completely built on immigration. Right. We forget about Um. But even if one family like ours is allowed in, the fact that they can assimilate, they can become American so quickly is th the power of this country. This is what Europe doesn't have. You have third, fourth, fifth generation people that are born in Europe, in France and Britain, that never feel French, that never feel English. And this country never had that, and it never does. My job is to make sure that never happens, right? Mm -hmm. All of us who come from different places. Um, so that's the long version, no, <laughs> but it's, it's that's that's the beginnings of where we came from. And thank you, that is a, a beautiful and important story. And anyone listening now understands why I wanted you to sit with us now in this moment. Uh, with everything else happening in the world, but also your your story is timeless, you know, because you you get to the states, yeah. um, you end up on the basketball team and the football team and living this like Ferris Bueller life outside of Chicago, yeah. right? <laughs> and um, and by the way, yeah. like when we were growing up in the Midwest, Chicago, that was the center of the universe. Yeah, I mean, we had John Hughes, like you're right. This is like like you know yeah. eighty five to. In 84 to 88. When you had I Michael Jordan and the Bulls. We had Michael Jordan and the Bulls. Yeah, you had the we Bears. Had, we had the 85 Bears, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. We had house music, B96. This is Chicago was like creating this stuff. We had the best rock bands like Smashing Pumpkins. All these guys were coming. We'd go to our friends' garages and watch these guys perform. And then you had like 16 Candles, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You had Breakfast Club. There wasn't a kid in Chicago that was thinking about New York or LA or why am I here? We were in the greatest city in the world coming up. And even though we were in Champaign, which was like a big suburb of it, right. it was still, it was still Chicago, you know? I love Chicago and, and I love, <laughs> I love your Chicago story. I love Chicago in the summer. I think it's such a special place. Um, and your Chicago story is is almost as amazing as your American story, which is as amazing as your New York story, right? Yeah. So you go, you grow up in Chicago, and take us through how you eventually end up in New York. So the New York story, you know, which is all the, these wonderful American stories, right? It's all about America, and you know, I I went to University of in, Champagne. I went to community college, Parkland College. So I couldn't get into University of Illinois where we're growing up, but it was all right. You know, you're still on campus kind of. Yeah. And then I don't know. I came home one day. I was kind of a smart ass and I came home and bo imagine both my parents are professors. My brother, he's a mechanical engineer. He's a, he's an amazing, he's, you know, he's a, he's a, he, he went, he got so many degrees. He can't even count. And I, I'm the smart ass and I'm always like, all I cared about was like creative, creative, creative. So I came home one day and I looked at my parents and said, I have a, I have great news. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, you have great news? Because your, your grades aren't that great. I'm like, no, but I have great news. I'm done with school. 
and school is done with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I drop out. Right. My dad was so mad. Like, I don't think he talked to me for like a year. I don't know. Somehow my mom feels bad. She lends me 500 bucks and on her credit card. And I, mo- I just moved to New York. And this is where, you know, the legend of, of Rossi grows. This- and I, I got to ask you for a second. Yeah. Everyone calls you Rossi. Yeah, that's my last like, name. Right. But do they call your brother Rossi too? Does it get confusing or is this like- they, My dad it was, because, you know, he was PhD. He was like, a, yeah. he was a doctor. So it was always Dr. Rossi. Yeah. And then, you know, my brother kind of, you know, especially on the football team, it was like Rossi. It was like Rossi. Sounds good. They used to be like Rossi. And so when you did call my house and you were like, is Rossi there? My mom would be like, which one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but, um, and and I think my first name, Mazdak, was like really difficult in right. central Illinois. So I had like many variations of it. So <laughs> my friends used to call me Mazda, like the car company. Right? I mean, so when I first came to New York, I made this thing. It was like, it's Rossi. And um, was this your entrance into branding? I mean, yeah, you, you were kind I mean, of this, without, this entire examination. You is know, a, is looking a, back now, it was, you know, it was the stage name, I guess. I was like, okay, that's it. But I came here with nothing and I, I came to New York and I, I just knew one dude, this guy, Eitan, he was from Israel. And he, um, I met him on a beach in Florida and we started talking. And so I just called him. I said, I'm landing at LaGuardia. Um, and he picked me up in a white limo, and he, and I try I I came. I was like, oh my god, a limo! And he's like, no, dude, sit in the front. I'm the limo driver. He was a limo driver. So, so so like he's like, no, you don't get to sit in the back. Like I drive limos for a living. So I lived on Aton's couch in Avenue X in Coney Island. I was like, is this New York? Because it's like so far. But it was the best. And he looked at me and he was Israeli and he said, listen, um, you you can sl- sleep on my couch, but you just, you got to get a job. You got to work. Like, you know, and I was like, done. I remember I took an NNR train, got out on Broadway and 8th and I walked into a gap and I filled out an application. I lied that I do windows. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a job doing windows at the gap. And that was my first job in New York City. Meaning setting up the windows yeah, or like, washing you know, the windows? You, you tuck in, no, you tuck in the sleeve into the mannequin, yeah. and all of that. Just made it up. Entrance into, into fashion now. Into, yeah, that was my right? first interest. And then, and then. Let uh, me ask you, go, go yeah. back to Champaign, Illinois, because before we get into New York, where you start riding subways, I got to ask you one of the questions we ask of every guest. Mazda Rossi, what was your first car? It was an Audi 5000 S that I bought. It wasn't new. It was like super old. I bought from my best friend Sergio for 2000 bucks. I paid him cash. And I think my Alpine speaker, my Alpine system was more expensive than the, the car. But, you know, I've always worked. Even when we were kids, me and my brother, we had paper routes. We worked at the Olive Garden. We worked Giordano's Pizza, Deep Dish. I mean, I've always worked because we had no money. Right. You know, so we had to make our own. And but always felt comfortable. Like my parents always made us feel comfortable because if you grew up in a Persian family, there's one thing you always have is food. Right. Lots of Persian food, rice, tadik. So all my friends would come over to our house. Kids that were like a lot wealthier than us would come over to our house to eat, you know? And that's the one thing like in in the in, in Iran and, and also Persian families, and it's like your parents, no matter what they have or they don't have, you know, you have this amazing family unit and that, you know, kind of keeps you really. And the tadig is like the, the comfort food, right? Yeah. Tadig I mean, is like, like the, the burnt rice at yeah, the bottom. Yeah, the good stuff. And if you're a good kid and you had good grades, which I, you get the tadig. So you got to fight good for stuff. it. In a household, you're fighting for the tadig. What color was the car? It was silver. Of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> So you you live this life where you've got all these characters like the dude in the limo and your friend Sergio and you know the, the this cast of characters that are the, it, it's a movie. I hope it will be a movie. I hope you write a book about your life and maybe this is the first step toward that because it's this incredible journey uh, of of starting in Iran, ending up in Chicago, coming to New York, and then grinding, right? Like grinding. hustling. Yeah. And grinding, yeah. you're working at the Gap. You got a couple hundred bucks in your pocket. You're living all the way out in in Coney Island, and yeah. was the first you know business entrance uh, of of note. 
the real estate move or no the, it was about- it was really like i i would i had like five jobs because you know yeah. you were you know, you you're had, a portfolio kind of guy, yeah. Right? Like even now, <laughs> you know, milk is this is this wonderful yeah, uh, ecosystem can't stop. of different businesses yeah. and brands that yeah. are all spectacular and all very different, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, there was this idea, like, and I guess a lot of kids who make this trip to New York are like, "There's no going home. Like, you got to make it." Mm. And especially in in an Iranian Persian, like, you're either a doctor, a lawyer. Everyone's educated, so right. like. You you know, the minute I dropped out, you're like, you have to lose their word on your forehead. And so you have to prove yourself. And and when I got here, it was, I was so broke. I remember there was like three of our friends, there was like four of us, you know, we're all like, and I remember, you know, mustard sandwiches for a week. I remember buying a loaf of bread and a bottle of mustard and eating that for a week because I had no money. Like I couldn't afford. And then all of a sudden, like your friend, we we'll get his paycheck, and then we'll all have falafel, right? It was like, <laughs> and then like you'd get your paycheck, and then you'd take all your friends for like hummus, right? And so, so you know, but m- the people actually was funny is like the the people that I started to meet through my friend Aitan was was a lot of the Israeli real estate guys. So I started working, showing apartments in New York. I walked the Upper East Side. I went through like ten pairs of shoes, and he would, uh, Ronan would put, you know, I would work for him, and he would put. A, a, an ad in the New York Times and I would show the apartment I would make 20% of the fee and then so I started that by within two years I had his company it wasn't even a company I'd like we had eight guys and I, we had a little office and then I ended up renting an, a, a penthouse to this kind of like really wealthy Israeli guy named Moshe Mana who to this day is my partner and Moshe had Moshe's moving and he was like a New York centric guy everybody knew Moshe's moving and he got this insane apartment. At the time, it was like six grand a month. That would be like a two bedroom now, right. like not even. Right. But I rented him this apartment and he looked at me one day and he goes, you know, he's like, oh, so um, I'm doing a birthday party. And I was like, oh, and he invited me and I got to meet him. We kind of became a little bit friends. And then his partner, Erez uh, Sternlicht, who was like running the company, all of his companies. And he said to me, Hey, uh, what are you doing? I was like, well, I work as a bartender at night. I, I work at the Gap during the day. I, I intern at this casting company. I mean, I had so many jobs just to pay the bill and try to figure out. And he said, you know, we bought a building in the meatpacking. And I said, you guys did? He goes, yeah, we bought a building in the meatpacking. And I was like, and I had a friend, this guy named Carl, who who was a photographer. I didn't know anything about it. And I was like, I was like, oh, and I looked at him and said, oh, maybe... He goes, do you want to come up with an idea or something maybe we can do there? And that's kind of the first, that was nine. That was 1995. So at the time, the meatpacking came district 92. was still undeveloped. There's no uh, High Line. There's no Standard Hotel. There's no, no West Side Highway. It was the scariest out, like- neighborhood in New York. Yeah. I mean, the meatpacking was like, and they bought the building. And like 95, I started hanging out with those guys, talking to them. 96, uh, January, I I gave him a, an, a proposal, like a little bit of a business plan on um, a photography studio concept that I, I had to like go to 10 friends to figure out how it works. And I kind of bullshitted it. It wasn't all there. And and uh, that was January of 96. I gave it to, to Ares and I didn't hear from them in April. Ares called me out of the blue and he said, hey, um, where are you? I said, oh, I'm on my the fifth job for the day. He goes, where? I said, 18th Street, you know, 7th Avenue. He's like, I'll pick you up in 15 minutes. I said, all right. And I remember it was raining and I went downstairs. I sat in his car. He goes, great, we start tomorrow. So I start what? He goes, you know, that studio thing you wanted to do. And that was milk. That was the beginning of milk. And uh, April 96, you know, I was 24. Uh, sorry, I was 25. And we started Milk Studios. and um, And it just... We opened about a year later, and it just went. I mean, it there was no stopping us. And I, I was just this kid who was like, nothing is going to get in my way. And I remember, like, you know, it was really quick because I we kind of I thrusted us into this industry, which was like fashion and media and models and photographers. And I remember, like, uh, a few months later, uh, you know, standing in all this construction and, the guys like walked up to me. I was like, Eris Moish, hey, I want you to meet someone. And they're like, 
who? I'm like, this is Calvin Klein. He's going to do all his shows here. And they were like, like the gene? <laughs> I was like, no, this is the real dude. You know, it's like, and we just took off. Our first booking was like American Vogue and, and it just went. And, and I think everyone was like, who are these kids? Like, we were like kids, you know? And, and, you know, I remember the first time I met Anna Wintour and I met all these people and like, I rolled up on my skateboard to Condé Nast and, you know, we were just these kids and we had nothing to lose. And it was like our turn. The one thing I remember is I would meet all these big people in the industry and they didn't know what I've been through that I've been through a revolution of this. Like, right. There was no stopping. This is the thing about refugees and immigrants, right? I don't, there's no stopping them. This is why America thrives because we, you know, it's ours to take, right? And, and I remember looking at someone in the industry, a big name, and I was like 25. And I said, you're going to have to step aside. It's our turn. Mm. And they were like, who's this kid? <laughs> <laughs> And that's how we built it. And that's how Milk became what it was. And then once we became a little bit more established, that's when we decided we got to give back to the young ones. That's why we built Made Fashion Week, which was really a fashion program that was free of charge for young designers to show at Milk. This is when I when I met you. My wife came into the picture and started working with you guys because that's the inflection point where I saw, uh, I got, you know, I walk into this place that's like a beehive of cool. I don't know. I couldn't describe it to people, except now as a community organizer, I realized what it was. You, you were organizing people. It was, yeah. it was a home. It was a safe place. And it maybe kind of cuts back to that feeling that you expressed earlier about going into your home, right? Yeah. Like I, I felt like when I walked into Milk, everybody was welcome. And it was random as fuck. Like people from yeah, all over, everywhere. right? You had these fashion people and then you'd have snowboarders and then you had me and you had just a randomest, beautiful collection, yeah. kind of like a Studio 54 type thing, but for the people. Like yeah. brought down and a lot of young people, right? And this creative yeah. energy in a place where it was celebrated. But it was also a business. I mean, you guys were, were, were humming and we could see this stuff starting to develop and the Milk brand uh, kind of became an anchor in the meatpacking district. And that building became an anchor uh, for, for this expanding ecosystem throughout that part of the city. Uh, there's the story I think that Kanye says about Alexander Wang was like sitting on your doorstep or something. Yeah. Right? I mean, it was like that, you know, all the, the, I remember when we put, and you gave him a shot. I think that's important, Rossi, right? Like you yeah. were the guy who gave other guys like you and gals like you a shot. Right? Yeah. These up and comers it was, it who were It was just hustling. like, I remember going to all the big brands and saying, look, you don't know these guys yet. Yeah. They're all like young designers and they're all young creatives. But one day you're going to, everyone's going to know them, but this is our roster. And it was like Alexander Wang and Prenza Schooler, Joseph Altazara, and it was like Hood Bayer. It was even Virgil Abloh and all of the beginning. They were, this was all their home. And of course, Kanye was kind of the established, but he, you know, Milk has always been about emerging and established coming together and this curation. And so we did that in fashion, we did it in music, we did it in, you know, creative art. We built a gallery, which we do exhibitions and shows in. And that was the moment where like Milk went from a rental photography fashion studio to a cultural center, like Warhol's factory, like PS1. Like, and that's when everything changed. And that was at the cusp of digital. That's like when pre-Instagram, pre all this right, stuff. Right, and right. we were kind of there. The, all of those platforms were coming to you us. Were the in, you were the insurgents in some levels, right? And, and at a time when Fashion Week used to be centered up in Bryant Park, yeah. right? And you guys were like the alternative fashion. We were the, the downtown fashion We were downtown. Fashion week. And the idea was and like- And a lot more young people, people of color, uh, you know, people who were, who were taking bigger risks- Right. For me, yeah. you know, bouncing yeah. back, back as kind of a tourist among this world, that was, you know, the established kind of the corporate. You were the up and comers, right? Like you yeah. were the hustlers. And we were it. And we knew that that streetwear and that that vision was going to take over fashion. It was going to take over all the Tommy Hilfiger's, all the Calvin Klein's. It was going to take over Louis Vuitton. It was going to take over all that. And it has today. Right. Because all their creative directors, all their collaborations are with those kids now. And so, you know, luxury became cool mm. and, 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 and relative. Like a lot of people be like, oh, that's, you guys are cool. You do. It's not cool. It's rel it, We were relative. Mm. We knew what music, what, what 
what it all meant, like the art, the photography, the architecture, everything came together. And it's always been that. It's a clan. It's a, it's a group. And now it's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, and so that's what Milk Studios were with its nine divisions today. We, in New York, we, we have about 150 employees in the meatpacking, just in Milk Studios and its group. In LA, we have about 100 and we have a big studio there and they do the same. And, and then about four or five years ago, we decided we're going to build our own consumer product line, which we then as a kind of as a side project created Milk Makeup. And the makeup was like, okay, we're not going to build a makeup for professional makeup artists. Makeup. We're just going to do it for our community, this amazing community we built around Milk. And so put a small team together at Milk, uh, and then I, we started ideating. And I remember walking into a studio and saying that we were shooting Sephora's campaign. You know, it's a big retailer in right. beauty. I walked in and I was like, uh, I went to the creative director. I'm like, listen, you know, we've been working for a while together, but like, what if we have an idea for a makeup line? Like, who do we talk to? And they're like, they're called merchants. <laughs> so I was like, oh, what does that mean? So we flew to San Francisco, pitched them this idea for milk makeup. And it was about our community. It was about like, the whole concept was, it wasn't what you put on or what, what kind of makeup you do. It's like what you do in it that matters. Mm. So the idea was that we're going to tell the story of everybody who loves their shit, but we're going to tell the story what they do for their, them, the people. Right, right. And we're never going to talk about like how you do your makeup. We're never going to talk about... So we kind of did this concept and it blew up. And, and it, it has blown up, right? I mean, you've yes. had a lot of successful ventures out of the milk mothership. Yeah. But this one, Nothing from a visibility, like revenue, yeah. impact yeah. standpoint... Yeah, is, impact is, as well. I mean, big business, but impact because... And I was coming here today. Yeah. My, the babysitter was with my kid. And I was like, oh, I'm going to interview this guy. And she saw, I said, the milk, milk makeup. She goes, I know milk makeup. Yeah. And she grew up in Venezuela. We were walking in here. One of the, the women who work in the, in the, in the yeah. car club says, I'm wearing milk makeup right now. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, and this has gone global. On it's, a gone, very, it's gone really big. I mean, it's only four. It will be four years old in yeah. February. Yeah. So it took off. But it is, a, it's really, you know, the idea is that, that, um, you know, we are, we're not a beauty company. We're not a makeup company. We're, we're community builders and we're content creators and we're creatives. And we found the concept of beauty really fucked up. Because you can't just talk about the beauty without talking about the ugly. And so what we did is we decided, like, we are going to be a platform that, like, a million kids, boys and girls, are going to talk about the concept of beautiful because 99.999% of people don't think they're beautiful, you know? And, and for 20 years at Milk, we've shot every campaign of the biggest cosmetic companies. It's usually a huge supermodel that looks so incredible that 99.99% of the world will never look like her or a makeup artist that does an amazing eye or a lip that not, Anyone back home can ever reproduce right, that, right. right? So it's the whole thing. And they, we call that aspirational marketing, but it's really like, look at it. You'll never be it, but buy the products, you know? Right, right. So our theory was, we're not going to do that. We're never going to tell you how to do your makeup. We're not going to work with big makeup artists. What we're going to do is just talk about our community and, and what people feel inside. And that could be beauty. That could be one day I feel powerful. Another day I feel ugly. Another, and that's why I think it's resonated with this generation. Mm. So we are a Gen Z brand. We're the fourth fastest growing brand at Sephora. And we launched in the UK. We launched in Europe last year. Uh, and now it's going global and we're working on it. It's, the, it's been my full-time job for the last three years. I've been working mostly on that. But it's it's... You know, there's very few companies in the world that are B2B, business to business, mm. that switch to B2C, which is business to consumer. There is, I mean, it's lit, the world is littered with companies failing right. at that. And we somehow were able to do it. And I think it's because we were really true to what we believe in. And there's a real sense of that value set in everything that you do. You also got to do it with your wife. Yeah, right? who, who is who is also amazingly talented, yeah. has her own story from coming from the UK here, and you guys had this 
amazing dynamic glamorous couple and you're traveling the world you know working together you you're this uh yeah. super power team man on a, on, a, on another level yeah zena is incredible so I for mean, folks that don't know your wife yeah. explain to them so zena roberts rossi um you know she's she she's you've probably seen she does a lot of television she uh, works with e news and e television she does all the red carpet stuff she's um also is it, you know, editor at large of Mary Claire. She used to be a beauty editor. So when we first kicked off beauty, I was like, I went to her. I was like, yeah, I don't know anything about this. I was like, I'm just a burly dude. Like, talk to me about this, you know? She's also wonderful. She's, She's so, so great. kind yeah. and brilliant and thoughtful. And when I kind of, you know, got exposed to that world of fashion, she was one of the nicest, most authentic people. You know, someone who would stop and look you in the eye and ask you how you're doing. We would talk about kids. We'd yeah. talk about other things. You know, she she's from... She's born in Manchester, England. She's a northern girl. They call so they're like amazing. And I mean, it was we have an amazing team because our other two founders that I brought in were also Georgie Gravel, who's a filmmaker at Milk, that became our creative director of makeup, and Diana Ruth, who also is an amazing. She's the wizard. She's the one who makes all. The, we're a vegan line. We're cruelty free. We're clean. We don't use any silicone and parabens and all that stuff you see in other makeup. So our, our line, so we, we're this four dynamic duo. Mm -hmm. And then me and Zana being husband and wife, like you, know, you always hear horror stories about working with family. None here. Like it was one of the greatest moves and it's, it's to work together. We, you know, we try not to bring it home. Um, but you know, when you look at our kids, you know, it's like, they're, they're, I look at them. I'm like, we have two daughters, they're twins and five and a half years old. And I'm like, they're half Iranian Persian descent, half Manchester, England, you know, hardcore Northern born and raised in New York city, you know, like at NYU born at 31st and first, like. This, these are going to be two of the toughest girls you've ever met. They're coming, right? <laughs> Juno and Rumi, they're five and a half now, right? Yeah, and you yeah. guys were about a year ahead of Lauren and I when my son was born. And we looked to you guys kind of as a, a bit of a parenting role model because you've kept family center and you're in this world that sometimes can be so celebrity driven and so image based, but you guys are, you know, bringing it down with the kids and keeping it. We went to your birthday party with your, <laughs> your girls, which was like the most fun thing ever. But how do you, um, I feel like they're superheroes being cultivated in this magic place. Yeah. And I can't wait to see what, what they're going to do. But it's also, again, like a great American success story, right? Yeah. Like where they, that you two can come together, that you're starting a real estate company at the time, an Iranian guy with, with an Israeli guy, given what's going on in the world right now. Yeah. Like that's what we need more of is, yeah, is collaboration I mean, and understanding and, and the idea that we can meet in a central place and do something really special if we have a common goal. And that's what you've done throughout your journey. But I got to ask you, you know, you have so much inspiration, but you're also very deeply involved. You're tracking on what's going on in the world. And I asked this of all our guests, Mazdaq Rossi, what makes you angry? What makes me angry is the hate, you know, the hate that I read about and the hate that's like percolating in this country. That's, you know, just being almost like invited up. And we all, we all know. And, Everybody knows racism and a lot of this hate has always been there. I grew up in the Midwest and, you know, I grew up with, you know, central Illinois and, and all. And, and you, you, it's always been there. But, like, you always knew that every generation was going to correct it and, and, and bury it. Not under the ground, but, like, kill it, you know. And I think what really makes me angry... Uh, some people say it makes me sad. It actually pisses me off is that there is an allowance for it to kind of come back. And, um, and, and that is the part that I hate. And I, rem I remember being 10 years old on a playground in, in Illinois playing with this young kid and we we're running around. We were one year in this country and um, this parent came and grabbed the kid and looked at me in the face, it was a dad, and said, go back to your country. I was crushed. Mm. I, was, I was so scared. Imagine what I just mm -hmm. came through, a revolution, a hatred, and I saw, but, but I, 
I knew that was one person. Mm. It didn't, did, you know, years later, I like forgave them. And I was like, they're ignorant, you know. Mm. And like, you hear more and more. And of course, we're in the social media, so it comes up more. Mm. But that narrative, we have to crush. We have to fight. Um, and that's what, you know, when I read about citizens, Americans that are, just happen to be born in Iran or Iran being held up at, you know, it's going to happen to me tomorrow. And that's why I wanted to, when you said, hey, come on the show, I want to come. I, I just flew in. I travel a lot. I know that's probably going to happen to me. Maybe not next week or week, if this is still going on, that, you know, JFK, they're going to pull me aside and put me in a room for eight hours, just like it's happening. It's not happening to a few people. It's happening to hundreds of like Americans who love this country, who grew up here, who played basketball, football, who's assimilated, never thought they would ever going to be pulled aside. Go, you know what? In your passport, your U.S. American passport, it says you were born in Iran. Like, that can't happen, you know? Because that is, we we are, you know, if, if I got called tomorrow to serve this country, I would do it in a minute. I am American, you know? And it's like, that's going to be devastating and we need to be really, we, we have to fight that. And um, it's not okay. I love you, man. <laughs> One of the many reasons I love you, man. But I think that I was excited to have you on this show so that you could expand upon those ideas because you are such a powerful um, story and a powerful leader and a powerful voice and an ambassador for this country. I mean, yeah. you're, you're going around the world as a positive example of what this country can do and what this country's all about when we were on our way in we were talking about the events of the last couple of days i was on cnn till one in the morning last night with chris como covering the bombings and you know as we record this thankfully there were no american casualties no no iraqi casualties things are settled for now but i think we all know that we're in a new normal now and our president we hope can control himself, but if he can't, he can continue to instigate challenges around the world. And there's one issue in particular that, that, that I wanted to talk to you about, given your background and your focus on the arts, is talk to me, Rossi, about your reaction to hearing Trump say we would bomb Iranian cultural sites. Yeah, I, it's, it just shows you also like there's no one reviewing or helping him with what he tagged tweets you know like yeah. this was the most asinine thing i've ever heard and you know if you would have just took that part out you know would have been another tweet but <sighs> you know it, it would be like us bombing the pyramids i mean this is not about iran this is about civilization there are over 20 unesco heritage sites in iran that go back thousands of years um you know and it just makes no sense i mean you could just tell this is like unfortunately it's the president saying it so there's a lot of weight to it but it's so elementary in like trying to evoke something but the repercussions on top of being illegal and you know america you know going from being good guys to like being evil people um, you know, it would be like blowing up Persopolis, which is like the cradle of civilization, would be like us going and blowing up the top of the pyramids just to prove to the Egyptians that we can or, you know, it makes no sense. And if this is the thing, I mean, if you really look at cultural sites in Iran, they're divided into two groups, right? There's really ancient stuff. There is like and it's and in America, maybe in America we can't grasp the fact of like I was reading this great article about from another Iranian that says you know we get up in the morning and walk across a bridge that's three thousand years old, like maybe Americans don't realize that, but it would be like someone blowing up Mount Rushmore or like and you the know, Brooklyn Bridge and the Brooklyn Bridge and the Statue of Liberty and, and, it's and like, the Hollywood sign and Lambeau Field and the right, Grand but, Canyon, right? It's not just about killing people it's not it's, it's about it's, it's about erasing it's your culture erasing culture yeah and that's not going to go like we there you know that that i think makes no sense there's no strategy and it's to not this. what americans do right it's what it's what isis does it's what the nazis do right 100 it, 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 we lose our moral high ground so quickly immediately and we become the bad guys yeah. right and then there's the the other part which is the other where 
it's that they're religious sites, right? Mm -hmm. So one is they're cultural sites and right. they're ancient, they're historic, and they belong to the world. They don't belong to Iran. They belong to the world. It's our civilization where we all came from, you know. And then the other side is they're religious, right? They're the religious cultural places. Like you want to hit, you know, a 700-year-old mosque that that's going to unite. That's not going to make us any safer. Then you have the entire Islamic world that's going to be up in arms. None of this makes sense. That's not, this is all escalation. And I think everything going forward needs to hopefully be about de-escalation. And, you know, and I think the one thing with the Iranians, hopefully back home and the people, you know, I don't have a lot of connection there. And a lot of our relatives we haven't talked to for years, but, you know, they're people too. And it's like, I think it's it's all about trying to de-escalate and you know there are children there there are people there um and I hope I hope that it starts to come back down and all this rhetoric stops but the cultural thing was just like you know in a way you want to just go oh this was a blunder I had to talk to you about that and I also wonder if it's people like you and this ecosystem of your friends that are artists and creators and business people that may be our most effective strategy in combating this, right? Like they can hate Trump and have, you know, a Kanye album and some milk makeup and, you know, consume your media and you can kind of get around some of that in a way that culture, only culture can. Right? Yeah. There, there's 81 million people in Iran today, right? It's big. 60% of the 81 million are under the age of 30. People that are young, you know, they're not American haters. Yeah. And they're not Western. Most of them are, they, you know, they have relatives here. There's 500,000 Iranian Americans in this country. There's 300,000 in Los Angeles. You know, yeah. they call it Tehrangelis, yeah. yeah. you know. And they're all vibrant Americans. You you would be a, a great if we had well, an ambassador to Iran, if if in, in, in another <laughs> world with another president, and, and maybe in the future. I don't no, know. You're exactly the kind of cultural ambassador. We, I mean that because we've got to appeal to those young people. We've got to appeal appeal to something that is personal and not political, and something that's aspirational and something that's uniting. And and so much of what you've done has been that ambassadorship. You know, you're an ambassador right now for makeup. <laughs> like it's, I, I I did not expect you know you Neither did to, I. to be this ambassador <laughs> for makeup, right? But you could equally be an ambassador for American culture and for Chicago. Would would you ever? Run for office? I've told you I want you to run for mayor. I told I you, you I want I you know, to run for I mayor. Know, I know. <laughs> but would you ever run for office or serve? And if if they called you, to, uh, there, there's a really important need for cultural. I I um, think ambassadors. I think my best place. And you've met you've met many of the candidates over the yeah, years. I you've hosted many of yeah. them, right? Yeah. And and I'm not going to. So I'm, would you? I'm would involved. You, I'm, I think it's important to be involved. I I said I did a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton a, a while ago when she was just a. a senator and, and and i remember she was in the milk gallery and she said to me she goes you really really into this like you're really involved like why and i said well i i lost one country i don't want to lose another one mm. like i really i'm one of the few people in this world that mm. like saw you know you lose you see a government and you see you know people take what we have for granted and and they think it can never end and it can, and it doesn't happen in one shot. It erodes over a period of time. Mm -hmm. And I think we are in that period and we have to fight to keep it going. And, and, and so I don't think my job, I don't think I am in a place to be in the forefront. I think I've always been the more effective being sort of in the background and helping and shaping. And I think that, you know, even with the businesses we've built and the, communities we've built and the collaborations we've done um you know it's never been based on politics you know i i heard a great thing a long time ago uh i think i love policy i hate politics you yeah know? yeah i mean if we can help create great policy just like we do in our businesses every day and processes and what we stand for and our values fine politics i mean it, you look at washington dc it's yeah. basically like you know one million lawyers in one city that's not a place i want to be <laughs> what do you rossi what do you think of the candidates 
Um, have you you've met a lot of them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. I'm 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 for Biden. I I, I met him and and I know the family and I think he has the best shot. I think he's getting better and better and and you know it's boot camp. Um, and you know the most important thing as as a Democrat and, and I want obviously I care about a lot of the. I don't like to use the word liberal. Like I think when you say like you want women to have choice, you're, that's, you're not a liberal. Choice means you can be pro-life or not, you know? Like, right. so, so I look at it as just like, I'm definitely think that, you know, I do think that the best way for Trump to move on is for us to pick somebody else. And I think that um, the people need to speak and I think they will. I'm optimistic. I, I think that um, when it's going to finally come down to a choice, people are going to make the right choice because we can do better than this. Mm. You, yeah. saw, you saw Bloomberg up close a lot. And I think it's important for people outside of New York to better understand the perspective. You were a business owner, yeah. right? You were in one of these development, you know, economic development areas that has now yeah. exploded during. You blew up while Bloomberg was mayor, right? Yeah. I mean, that the kind of parallel. What, what are your thoughts on, on Bloomberg as a leader, yeah. and then him, you know, entering this this race right now. Yeah, I, I was on a few committees that he had set up and got to meet him, and and um, he's amazing. But you know, I I do think that um, going back to where we are today, I I think he got a late start. I, I'm not a political expert, but um, I I think that it's you know we're. I I do want to see him on stage with the rest of the group debating and that really hasn't happened yet. So it's a little bit of a sideshow for me. Yeah. Even though I think the world of him, I think he's an incredible person. I think he's done amazing for New York. I think he could be very good. It's just like I think the whole thing unfortunately a little bit on the democratic side it's a little bit unorganized and and maybe a little bit a little yeah, bit yeah, like, a little it's bit. like so so we're all sitting back like trying to figure out like when is the stars going to start aligning right, yeah i've talked right? about we a lot on the that. show when are they going to have their game of thrones moment when are they yeah. going to all unite and i think bloomberg um did get a late start i ran into mayor nutter last night at, at new york one and he's now i think one of the leaders for the bloomberg campaign he used to be the philadelphia mayor um, and I think a, a, a very effective mayor and an effective voice. And I, I, I kind of, I've been asking them, you know, Bloomberg said his goal is to defeat Trump a and he, he wants to be president, right? But if you take him personally out of the mix and recognize that if the goal that most of us hope will happen is to defeat Trump, right? Not because it's partisan, but because it's in our strategic best interest. Bloomberg is like bringing a guy with a million guns to the fight. Because beyond him, he's going to run two Super Bowl ads at $10 million a piece, right? Mm -hmm. If he can take shots at Trump that weaken Trump for whoever is the eventual nominee, then I'm all in. I think that's something people yeah. have been forgetting about Bloomberg is he is strategic. He is incredibly calculating. He's run the numbers. He mm -hmm. knows it's probably like 4% chance right. he gets the nomination. Yeah. But there's probably a 95% chance that he can make an impact. 100%. And that's what he's done throughout his career, yeah. whether it's in philanthropy or the economic yeah. development of New York City or the smoking ban or guns. So if he can throw a lot of rounds, heat rounds into this fight that weaken Trump, that distract Trump, he's throwing, he's rolling out Judge Judy this week, which I think is brilliant because yeah. she's been very effective. And the idea of Judge Judy coming after Trump for the next year is going to hit him hard in, in his base, yeah. right? Among the people that really can be swayed. So I welcome Bloomberg. I admire Bloomberg. I don't know, you know, I don't think he's going to be the nominee, yeah. but I think people need to take a step back, especially Democrats who are just, you know, constantly eating their own yeah. and look at the larger strategic goal. And the strategic goal should be to improve America, move America forward. And we can only do that, I think, if Trump's out of the way. Right now, the biggest danger is what Trump might do. Right, he could have had the press conference today and gone off the handle and started saying more fiery shit and set you know things back instead of forward. We're hoping. I'm rooting right now for the best possible Donald Trump, but I'm preparing for the worst, and I think that's what we should all prepare for. And having a Bloomberg in the fight will help that, and I think having you in any capacity yeah. will help that. But I'm glad to hear you're optimistic, Rossi, and I want to ask you an another question as we come toward the end of this, and we've been enjoying this. <laughs> I mean, we drank all the tequila. I finished. I drank all the tequila too. Times like this, we got, and now we're moving over to the Johnny Walker. But um, 
you you bring positivity and you bring energy and you bring this sense of welcoming that I think is really important. And it, it it's I think it's American too. Yeah. I, having traveled the world myself, I feel like people underestimate how nice Americans are. Sometimes they're annoyingly nice, but you know they they're welcoming, right? Yeah. And uh, I think there's good reason to be optimistic, and there's always reason to be happy. So, Mazdek Rossi, what makes you happy? What makes me happy, you know, is really like this concept of health, right? Health in my family, health in my kids, health in my wife, health in my country. Like, you know, there is, you know, we can have material objects all we want, but like when someone goes, you know, when everyone does a to toast, you know, to health, it's the most important thing. But that also means for 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 our country, it means for uh, our businesses, it means for, you know, you can take it to like stock market, you can take it to all of these things. Health is, should be the barometer of everything. And, um, and that's, I think like, you know, we finished the year and we have about nine different businesses and sat down with all the teams, we had board meeting. And it was like, even from a business point of view, um, you know, it was like at the end of the meet at the end of the board meetings, we're like, man, everything's healthy. Like we're, we're very lucky in the term, you know, there's a lot of volatility out there. And so, you know, and I, and, and you, you really want to go through like all of these indicators in life, like business and family and children and parents and, and just be able to say one thing, like it's healthy, it's healthy. And when it's not, you know, it's devastating. You go in and you, you have a great support system to help it. And, and I think like that's really the approach people should have on, on this country is like really looking at it. Are we healthy? Like, do we feel good and safe? And, and, and you know, when you read like countries in the world, like we're reading like the quality of life, like yeah. the happiest places yeah, on earth, yeah. you know, it's like, you may think we can have all the money in the world. Like they're winning you know it's like mm -hmm. they're winning mm -hmm. when people are like living longer and they're enjoying themselves and you know and then, you know here we're doubling our defense spending and millet like to a point where it's like everyone's fighting about like health if you just took a fraction of that money and put it in there like you, you've resolved it so i don't know i just think like you know a country is just like antibodies the country is just like a human body and you know when it starts to build so much defense systems there's a reason there's bacteria there's mm. there's it's not healthy and i think that we we just have to like that's the part that that i i care about and um and you know it's not i mean it's crazy right now so we have to be optimistic yeah because if if everyone joins the bandwagon and starts talking this way then we're going to go down a slippery slope, which we're mm. kind of on. Yeah. I, I was on a, a TV show recently and before the show began, you know, some of the folks on there were saying, you know, I'm panicked. You know, we should be panicking. I said, no, you should not be panicking. Yeah. You should be angry. You should be involved. You should be concerned, but panic is not going to help. And especially if you're on television, especially if you're in the media, if you're in the, you, you have to be clear headed and thoughtful and focused, but you also in times like this have to take a breath Right. So I've been encouraging people to breathe, um, but also, you know, find the things that do make you happy. And as a, a seer of the future in terms of culture, my wife, from the moment she met you and met Milk, was like, these guys are going to be huge. They're going to be huge. They're going to be big. And my wife has a beautiful talent for spotting that and picking that, but so do you. So take a step back culture, music, art. Uh, you did an amazing activation with Scott Campbell, I think, at Milk. Yeah. We had on the show a couple months ago. Oh, great. Yeah. Where they went into Milk, I read about this, and they stuck their arm, people yeah. stuck their arm into a hole yeah. and got a tattoo from Scott Campbell. They didn't know what it was going to be until they yeah. pulled their arm out, right? It was a social experiment. <laughs> yeah. Like, it was like, I remember sitting with Scott, and he's such an amazing man, and he was like, you know, like, we got to do this social experiment. It was called Whole Glory. And the idea was that you know, we, we just had a hole in the wall. Yeah. And um, you you stick your hand through it. And and they didn't know Scott Campbell was behind it. No, they knew Scott. Oh, they there, did know Scott. Okay. But you can't talk to him. You can't say anything. 
And he, he, for one hour, your hand's through this hole and he does whatever he wants on the other side. And then you pull your arm out after an hour and you live with it for the rest of your life. And his concept was so crazy. So at first I was like- Video's really cool. If, you have, if you're listening and you haven't seen this, you can Google it, check out some of the video and go back and listen to Scott Campbell, yeah. brilliant artist um, yeah, and, and trailblazer. So we but, did that We did that in our gallery and then we, we kind of did it in, in, in LA and did it in Miami. We kind of toured it all over. But it was incredible how many, there would be like waiting lists. Yeah. And people were flying in from all over the the world people coming in from Russia it's not like drunk Johnny on the corner with a big pen yeah, doing no. jailhouse tattoos and, right? you know like, granted he's one of the top tattoo artists in the yeah. world and he is but I I was all I was so like oh my god dude, these people they're gonna live with, like you like you can't pull it on and go nah yeah. but you <laughs> but you see what's coming so talk to me what music or art or what's got you excited for people who might not be in your world is there anything that's got you excited that yeah, you want to share with people that this, you should tell them to check out? There's this new generation, you know, coming up, like they call them Gen Z, whatever. And what's, what is really exciting about them is that they're kind of the Renaissance. Um, they don't want to be an architect or a filmmaker or a designer or a musician. It's like all <laughs> like, right, dude, yeah. and this is like why I'm optimistic about where the world is going because they're kind of a little bit of everything. <sighs> And they can, you know, they can make a song, they can make a film, they can design a building. Um, and so this Renaissance generation's coming up and they are, they care about sustainability. They care about cruelty-free with the animal. They, they're just like, you know, it's funny, you interview a lot of them. We do it at Milk a lot. And it, everything starts with like, um, you know, I care about this. I'm I'm gonna make an impact. I'm gonna change. I mean, kind of Greta's in that group, yeah. right? You know, Greta Thunberg, the Greta Thunberg, the, the, the environmental and they're artists, all yeah. over. And and they have really thick skin, and they're the post-social generation. Mm. So instead of thinking like they're gonna shy away from it, they're realizing how they can use it not just for their own self uh, promotion, but like issues. Mm. So we're we're raising a generation that I'm really, really happy about. And and they're giving us hope. And I think um, parents of those kids or the ones that are now being 14, 15, you know, coming into the workforce are going to find them like revolutionary. Mm. Is it, I don't want to press you because remember like Aesop Rocky, all these guys will be coming through your shop. Yeah. Any, any musicians or creatives that in particular you want to shout out or tell people to check out yeah you? there's there's actually this young girl we just worked with her her name is Layla Blue she's this young I think she's like 16 um 15 16 17 I'm not sure um she's gonna blow up and you know a few years ago when when she was 15 I met with Billie Eilish Billie came to see us at Milk she just rolled in with her mom and her brother and 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 spent some time with her and and she and I remember walking out of the office telling the whole crew, I'm like, that girl's going to take it over. Yeah. And I think Layla, Layla Blue is one of them. So if you haven't um, heard her, just go on YouTube and download her stuff. And she's the next one, I think, coming up. There's a, there's a bunch of them. And, you know, there's a lot of like young... What I love is there's a lot of young photographers and filmmakers coming mm. up too. Um, on Milk, on our Instagram, we have about a million followers on Milk. If you go to Milk and follow it, um, we just released the top ten next gen I saw that, yeah. kids that we think are are kind of like, and they're all over the world. They're from Tokyo. They're from all over that we think are the next ones that are going to blow up, and and they're they're all kind of like revolutionary kids in their own and in, in their own way, and and that's the best place to see them. And every year we release our like top ten, and. Um, it's cool. And that's reason to be hopeful going into 2020, man. Yeah. Reason to be happy and optimistic. And you are reason to be happy and optimistic. Before we end, we have a ceremony that is reason to be hopeful and optimistic. And so I have the giving of the gifts. Um, yes. And I know you've been on the road a lot. So we have three pieces of this. I, I will yeah, hold, I'll hold your mic. Because cool. we're for audio first. Folks back home, you know this. You've been asked. This is starting to become a thing now. But as we go into 2020, so we have peeps, okay? We got peeps. We started the show around Easter. We've kept this theme going. Folks, if you like this or don't like it, let me know. Hashtag Angry Americans. But peeps is not yet an official sponsor. Hold on, before you get to that. Oh, I got so here's the question, Rossi. Yeah. 
Uh, three colors of peeps, blue, pink, and yellow. Yeah. Which color do you pick and why? Pink. Why? Well, pink is just like, it's, you know, female empowerment. I don't know. It's like, As the father no, of, I, father of, yeah, of yeah. girls, right? You've yeah, got two I girls. It. It's, um, you know what? We, were, we, we worked, um, we did a project where we worked on um, a new football team in Miami, the, the Miami uh, uh, team down there. And one of the colors I wanted- For the XFL? Or was it- For the MLS. Oh, for the MLS. Yeah, our, oh, our creative yeah. agency, myself. By and, the way, you're also just doing the branding for a soccer team in Miami. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. This is the and, kind of uh, shit that you drop along so, the way so while we're we, hanging out. I, we were yeah. crazy about men wearing pink. We wanted like the burliest soccer dudes to wear pink. And now it's like the hottest thing. I love that. And I think that's where you start breaking down all those, you See, know, norms and, and whatnot. I think that, that has not been picked often. And I love the reason you hold this mic for me, Rossi. <laughs> all right. So that's phase one. So we're going to come to the bottle last. But next, we got a note in there. But then we got yeah. some uh, American made swag. Yeah. Uh, you are the master of merchandise. So we might need your help kind of taking our merch to the next level. Um, but I'll hold your mic for you. you. Got some Angry Americans merch made by the guys from Oscar Mike who are in Illinois, just outside of Chicago. Oh, they did. So these guys make this in Chicago, veteran-owned uh, business oh, this out there. Great. So some righteous and Angry Americans merch, super comfortable. You can wear that. So I'm gonna wear this next time I go to Jeff K in case I get pulled yes. over. You it might not. Say, be, it'll just say Angry American. Yeah. Like if they hold me in the yeah. back for like eight hours, <laughs> well, they're like, you were born in Iran. Well, you better be call. Like, you better bring. You sometimes <laughs> travel with Sean White. You better bring fucking Sean yeah, White. Yeah, yeah. Right? I'll bring Sean White. <laughs> and, all right, and then lastly, hold the mic for me, Rossi. Yeah. We uh, always pick an American whiskey that I inspires you and inspires yeah. me. And I try to find something now. This is brand new, and it's from uh, the the folks at High West right. Whiskey out in right, Utah, yeah. and it's called Yippie Kaye. Yeah, I love it. It's a it's a blend of whiskeys, but they do it in a in a Syrah barrel. They do it in wine barrels, mm. and I think it's about this kind of Yippie Kaye uh, was an expression popular with the cowboys. Yeah. in the 19th century in, in, in the West. And you've been kind of a cowboy, man. You you you, you rode out of Iran and rode into, yeah. into Chicago and you've been a trailblazer. And, you know, you have this amazingly uh, adventurous spirit. And, Thank you. and you, you're on a ride that's incredible for us to witness and us to watch. I've been so grateful uh, to have you as a friend. Anybody who's never heard about Rossi before, they can find you on Instagram, Check yeah. out milk. Where, where, what else do you want to point them to? Um, yeah, you can, you can, you know, you can follow us on on milk on Instagram, milk makeup, um, as well. But you know, I'm around. I, I tr I'm always in the background. So you're fascinating. You got to watch <laughs> if you want to watch a guy living an amazing life and doing yeah. some cool shit. Follow Rossi. He's definitely um, a person that that I am honored and privileged to know. I'm honored to know your family Thank and you. to know Zana and to know the girls. And uh, I'm so grateful that you joined us now, given what's going on yeah, in the world. Yeah. I think people who are like, maybe they, they weren't familiar with you. Now that you've heard Rossi, you understand why he's such an important, iconic, and inspiring American. And we've just been grateful to have you on the show. And grateful for all you do for this country and all that you're going to do for this country, man. It's, it's an you, honor man. to have you on the show and to be your friend, Absolutely. man. Absolutely. And what you do and what you've created here and your podcast is, is, you know, we've been talking a long time about this. So I'm very proud of you. Yeah, I'm psyched to get it going, man. I'm following your lead. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Mazdeq Rossi here from Classic Car Club in New York. Happy New Year. Cheers, man. Cheers, brother.